Let us not forget everything that happens is by the will of a holy will. It's time to unite and say that we will be the best amongst men. It's not time to be extreme or to live in but to stand together. Followers streaming every day. There is platforms. Trust me, you'll find a way. Soon, the followers. She came from a family of warriors, trained to defend herself and fight on the battlefield. She was the one who took a pole and struck Abu Lahab and brought about his death. Join Ustada Layla Nasheba as she details the story of Um Fada, the mother of Ibn Abbas, ready Allah who on. Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Uh, welcome uh, to our series entitled The Heroines of Islam. And alhamdulillah, of all the different classes that we teach uh, after my Aqida classes, uh, this class, along with the uh, class on the Khalifa of Abu Bakr, have become two of the most uh, uh, talked about classes here as Sunnah followers. And the reason being, I believe, is because uh, myself and Brother Mukhtar, you know, we try to break down uh, the story of these companions of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and everything that we tell you is based on the authentic hadiths, you know, so that way you can see uh, these people and how they were devoted uh, to Allah and their faith and also you get to see too that many of the misconceptions that exist about women and men in Islam are simply that, misconceptions. Especially when we do a story such as Um Fadl. And that's the woman that, whose story we're gonna do today, the story of Um El Fadl. And I, before I go into her story, there's a couple of things that's gonna strike you about her. Number one, again, her story puts to rest, puts to rest the misconceptions about women in Islam. Her story is more proof that nowhere does Allah nor his messenger state that Muslim women are supposed to be invisible because none of the female companions were invisible. The women around the prophet were as just as visible as the men. They were helping to uh, spread the dawah just like the men. They were there at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. They were there at the Treaty of Medina. They were there for every important thing that happened in Islam, the first pilgrimage, everything. They were on the battlefield. And as many of you have now learned, <clears throat> the women were not just taking care of the sick. <clears throat> the women were also fighting sword in hand on the battlefield too, <clears throat> because that was the era in which the women lived. These were the sixth, seventh, eighth centuries and back in those days known as the dark medieval period i told you most people in fact all nations they would bury their daughters alive they only allowed a certain amount of females to be born a certain amount just to keep the population going but they would put their daughters to death the ones that they decided to keep alive they had to train them. 
the women of those eras were trained to work, to fight on the battlefield, just like the men, because they had to know how to defend themselves. Because back in those days, whenever war was declared against a people, the victor would take the women and children as part of the spoils. So the children were trained and the women were trained. And for those women that could not train well with the sword, they became experts, experts, experts in poison. And the women would walk around back in those days with bottles of poison on their person at all time, because you never knew when an invasion would break out. And no woman wanted to be somebody's uh, uh, bed mate or prostituted. So they would carry that poison on them. So if they should become taken as a captive of war, they would slip it into the drink they would slip it into the drink of their captor, hoping that it would kill them and they could walk away with their dignity, okay? And many women uh, would also drink the poison themselves and kill themselves rather than be a man's prostitute or, or, or chamber mate, okay? That was the era. So I've been telling you guys, these, so these women, especially the Arab women, the Arab women that were allowed to live you know, all of them were trained. They were trained to fight. They were trained to fight. They were trained to fight. That's why, as you guys learn, with the prophet's wives, Maimuna, his wife Maimuna was a trained warrior. We're going to do her sister today. Um Salama, she was a trained warrior. And the women would be paired up and they would attach to whoever they were paired up with. Sophia. The, the prophet's aunt, she was the sister of Hamza. Hamza trained her. She would spar with him. Okay. Um, uh, uh, um Salama, she was the cousin of Khalid bin Walid. She could wield a sword just as good as Khalid bin Walid could. She sparred and was trained with him. You know, this is how it was back in those days. If you're going to keep a girl alive, because they kept some alive just to populate the earth with. But other than that, women weren't viewed as being of any value back in those days. That's why it's called the dark ages. Women were of no value other than, you know, sealing a kingdom, you know, a, a war booty. And that's about it. Making baby. That's it. Put them to death. If they weren't beautiful enough to be prostituted, put her to death. That's just the, the era in which it was. So tonight, we're going to learn about another female companion who was also a warrior. She was the sister of Maimuna, who was one of the wives of the prophet. And not only that, she was the aunt of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam too by marriage because she was the one who married Ibn Abbas. But another lesson that you're going to learn from her. And I want you sisters, I don't have to name y'all. Y'all know who y'all are. I still, can y'all believe it is the year 2023 and the war has already begun against Muslims. And I still have three, not five no more. It's down to just three now. Three knucklehead women. I still have three knucklehead women who are living in sin, who are shacking up. I repeat, shacking up because that's what it is shacking up, living with Kafir men who are not lawful for them because they're Kafir, but their love for these men is greater than their love for law. They still living in the same house with these nasty, filthy Kafir men, and they call these men their husbands. The woman I'm going to speak about tonight 
Y'all need to learn from her because she left her husband when she declared like you should have done years ago, you women. And she was did not live with him for 20 years. He did not convert to Islam until 20 years after her. For those of you who don't know, El Abbas was the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even though he helped the Prophet because he loved him as his nephew. Like Abu Talib, he, he did not convert to Islam until right before the conquest of Mecca. So this woman, his wife, had the decency to take her children who also converted and leave with no place to go with no place to go because they knew it was forbidden in Islam for a Muslim woman to be with a Kafir man. And I'm gonna tell you the big innovation we have today. The knuckleheaded women, the three I'm talking about, I ain't naming them, but they know who they are. If you ask them, why are you living with this Kafir man? You know what they say? Oh, I stay in one room. Did a law say you can do that? Did a law say that you, a woman, can live with a man who is not a mahram to her as long as she stays in a room? Did a law say that? Or did a law say you can never, ever, ever, ever be alone with any man who is not a mom. You three sisters, y'all better pray that Allah does not take y'all soul tonight. You better pray that Allah don't take your soul no time soon because you three women are an example as to what the prophet meant when he said some of you will be raised up as Kafir, Kafir, Kafir on the day of judgment. None of your good deeds accepted, none of your prayers, your fast, your nothing accepted because you took your desires as your God over Allah. And that's the only reason why you three women are still living with these men because y'all love them. You can lie to yourself, but you can't lie to a law. You can't lie to me either because I'm a woman and I know better. I know better because all of us women have been in situations like that. The strong can walk away and spit over their shoulder. You weak ones will sit there still doing what you women are doing, referring to these ugly men, these filthy men, these peasant men as your husbands. If you didn't want to be with them, you wouldn't call them your husband. If you didn't have no feelings for them, you wouldn't still be sitting there taking care of them. A couple of them taking care. Oh, he's sick, Layla. So you ain't got no business touching him. You ain't got no business caring for him. This man is not a mockum to you. He's a kafir. Maybe a law need to take his soul. Maybe that'll make you get up. You women had better fear a law. Well, tonight's story. She will be the third companion, female companion that I've spoken about, who showed her love for a law superseded that of a man because she packed her little children and walked away. Walked away and said, I'll eat dirt before I stay with a Kafir. When you women got jobs, you women can got children that you could go live with. 
you women can go get your own place. But no, your love for that swine is greater than your love for Allah. And I'm going to tell y'all why I refer to these men as being swine. Because guess what, guys? All three of these women I'm talking about, not only are their husbands Kaffirs, but their husbands are not like El Abbas, who tried to help his nephew. Their husbands are enemies to Allah. Their husbands speak badly about Islam. Their husbands speak badly about the Prophet Muhammad. Their husbands ridicule these women for becoming Muslim. Their husbands make fun of them, call them names. Their husbands curse our Quran. Their husbands are the swine of this earth. But these women are still with them. Can y'all imagine that? That hadith about being raised up a Kafir. Like I said, you sisters better pray that Allah don't take your souls. So with that said, let me set this up and begin the journey of this beautiful female companion tonight. Let me take everything down so you guys can see. I know you guys like to take PowerPoints, I mean, uh, screenshots of the PowerPoints. Let me first go on to, what is this? Yeah. Zoom. Okay. Cut my camera off. Go to here. Yeah, y'all like my little background there. Okay, hold on. This is going to be Umfado. Okay, I'll put her there. This is her PowerPoint, and I'm going to turn it on for you here. Put the screen this way. Yes, these sisters are married to men who hate Islam. These men are enemies to Islam. These men are swine, but their love for that swine is greater than their love for law. Ain't that sad, people, that in 2024, we love swine more than we do a law. Okay, let's take a look at it. Tonight, we're going to be covering a story of Um El Fadl. And I've talked about her before because when I did the story of her sister, Maimuna, I told you guys about her. When I did the story of Fatima, the daughter of the prophet, I mentioned her. And when I also did the story of Sophia, I mentioned her. But today I'm going to go into detail about her because one of the new Shahada, uh, in fact, it was uh, Deborah. Deborah, this is for you. Deborah, this is for you. She asked me to please go over the mother of El, uh, Ibn Abbas because she was confused between El Abbas, Ibn Abbas. And by the way, guys, for the new Muslims, let me just share this. I know the names are confusing. Arabic is a different language. It's not a religion, it's a language. And the Arabic people like to refer to themselves with their nicknames. They name themselves after their oldest child. And I know it can get very confusing. But Alhamdulillah, that's why you have me, you have Mukhtar, you have Dr. Jamali. That's what we're here for, to try to help you to understand. So this one is for you, Sister Deborah, the story of Um El Fadl. And Um El Fadl, and by the way, guys, I'm using um, an AI generator. Uh, one of the programs that your donations pay for that I use, Alhamdulillah, I figured out how to work it. And I, I put in there for it to generate. All the pictures that I'm going to be using today are how the Arabic women looked in the seventh century. This is how the Arabic women dressed. This is the jewelry they wore, the makeup they wore. So every picture that I use tonight I had it generate seventh century 
Medina Arabic women. So this is how these women looked. From the coal on their eyes to the makeup on their faces to the jewelry. So again, you sisters can see that what these brothers are telling you, that makeup's haram and stuff, it's not. Because this is how the women looked in the time of the prophet. This is how the prophet's wives looked. This is how the women looked in the time of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I had all these pictures generated since I figured out how to work that program, uh, Canva. So alhamdulillah. And today is the story of a woman who used to frequent the house of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She also suckled. She used to, she nursed one of his grandchildren. And she is the mother of a well-known companion of the prophet, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now her real name was Lubaba. Lubaba bint El Harith ibn Hazan ibn Bujer. And she was the wife of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. And who was Abbas? He was the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she was his wife. She was also the mother of Ibn Abbas. And you guys know who Ibn Abbas was. I use him all the time. I use his fatwas. When you guys ask me questions about Islam, when you guys ask me to explain verses of the Quran, I will give you the explanation of Ibn Abbas because he was one of the best of the best. He was given the good news of paradise. He was the one whom the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for asking Allah to give him a deep understanding of the Quran. He became one of the first scholars of Islam. He became the governor over Medina and his knowledge of Islam supersedes any mufti, any sheikh, any scholar any imam living on planet earth today. And by the way, Ibn Abbas said, not only can a woman show her face and hands, but any makeup or jewelry that she has on her face and hands, that's his fatwa I use. Okay? So this was his mother. All right. Before uh, 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 she, uh, she, before giving birth to him, she also gave birth to five more sons. Of course, her oldest son was El Fadil. That's where her nickname comes from. She was also the mother of Ubaidila, Mabad, and all of these names should sound familiar because my cousin Mukhtar has spoken about all these men. They were all uh, spoke, mentioned before. Kutum and Abdul Rahman. And also she was the sister of Maimuna, radiallahu anha, who was one of the wives of the prophet. And remember, I told you guys before when I did the story of Khadijah, after Khadijah, radiallahu anha, converted to Islam, this is the second woman because she and Khadijah were good friends. She was Khadijah, ready Allah, who on her best friend. And when Khadijah told her that the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a prophet and a messenger, Um Fado immediately converted. And she used to be a visitor at his house all the time because, again, she was his wife's best friend. And again, her husband, El Abbas, he did not convert to Islam. He did not convert to Islam until 20 years after her. So when the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the muslims left medina i mean left mecca of course she was no longer there either she was not with her husband either 
When Allah sent down the verses of the Quran telling the believing women that a believing woman could not be married to a Kafir man, she left her husband. Unlike you dean back women today who stay in a bedroom with your husband and still rub his back and feet and take care of him. And you ain't fooling nobody. You sexing him too. Come on. This is Layla you're talking to. All right. But in the beginning of Islam, before Allah sent down the commands saying that women could not be married to Kafir men, she converted to Islam. She was the second woman. And when she converted to Islam and accepted the Prophet Muhammad as a messenger, she kept it a secret. She didn't tell her husband, El Abbas. And remember, Abbas was a good uncle. He loved the Prophet Muhammad, just like Abu Talib did. He protected the Prophet Muhammad, just like Abu Talib did. You know, so her husband was not abusive, but she kept it a secret because she didn't want to bring no shame upon him, her husband. She tells us, in her own words, how one night she had a dream. And in that dream, she saw one of the Prophet Muhammad's organs or body parts in her house. She woke up and ran to the Prophet and told him the dream that she had. And he said, this is a good dream. He said, your dream means that my daughter Fatima my daughter Fatima is pregnant and she will give birth to a child and you will be the one to nurse him along with your son. So Supana Allah, she was so happy after having that dream. And by the way, you're gonna see that every picture I use is the same woman because what I did, I went to my AI generator and based on the description that the Hadith gives to us as to how uh, uh, this woman looked, they made her up. So this is how she probably looked. You know, I put the, that's that uh, program that your, your, your donations pay for. Please, guys, donate. I, I, this program is beautiful. I gave them the description that the Hadith says as to how she looked. And you're going to see every picture I use is her because it kept showing how she, that's the technology we have today. This is probably how Um El Fado looked. Okay. So here it is. She is again. It just so happened that her dream came true. When Fatima, ready Allah who on her, gave birth to El Hussein. Um Fadl nursed him. One day she took him to the prophet and the prophet hugged the child and he kissed them. And y'all going to recognize this hadith. The, he hugged the child and the child kissed and he kissed the child and the little boy urinated on him. And the prophet said, oh, Um El Fadl, hold my son because he just urinated on me. And then the prophet stood up and sprayed water over the wet spot. And he said, wash the spot if it is urination of a female baby. But if it's just a male baby, then spray it with water. And that's where that hadith came from. That was Um El Fadl. She was nursing El Hussein, the prophet's grandson. And the baby, uh, uh, the prophet went to hug the baby and the baby urinated. And that's where that hadith came from. And by the way, I want you to look at the dress. This is how the Muslim women dressed in Medina. I put in there, uh, seventh century Muslim women, Medina. Dress. And that's probably how, that's how they dressed. They did not cover their faces. I keep telling y'all, it is not Arabic culture to cover the face, okay? 
So this hadith is the hadith that we use today uh, that says, you know, as long as the baby is, is nursing, if it's a boy, just sprinkle water over it. If it's a girl that wets on you, then wash it. But this is only as long as the baby is, is not eating solid food. Also, there's another hadith that when Hussein urinated, Um Thada went to smack him lightly on his shoulder. And the prophet told her, oh no, oh no, you've hurt my son. May Allah have mercy on you. Playing, just playing with her because she didn't hit him hard. She just like, oh no, you urinated on the prophet. And she you know, hit him real softly you know, on the shoulder. And the prophet said, no, no, don't hit him. That's my baby, my son. Just a, a sweet little hadith to show how the prophet loved his grandson, okay? Another interesting, this is the same woman. Now this picture here, guys, was weird. I typed Um Fado holding up a wooden pole and this came up. <laughs> so, this is probably how she looked. Another interesting incident uh, in regards to Um El Fado is she was the one I told you about. She was the one that hit Abu Lahab with a wooden pole and he ended up dying from it. Remember I told you that she was the one that basically killed Abu Lahab. Because remember her and her sisters, the three sisters, they were warriors. Her, Maimuna, and the other sister were, um, I may say, were warriors. Listen to what Abu Rafi tells us. He said, I was a weak man carving cups near the well of Zamzam. He was a slave. He said, Um El Fado was also sitting there. Abu Lahab came angry. And he had with him Abu Sufyan. And Abu Lahab said, may you tell us what happened in Badr? And that's when Abu Sufyan said, we did nothing but give them, the Muslims, our backs to kill or capture us wherever they like. By Allah, I did not blame our army because the people we met were different. They were white and rode white horses. This is the battle of Badr. This is after the Allah sent the angel Jabril and all the other angels, they joined the prophet on the battlefield. There were men riding white horses dressed in white. Those were the angels of Allah that Allah sent to help the Muslims at the battle of Badr. So the, at the battle of Badr, the, the Quraysh were defeated and they went back to Mecca, they were angry. And this is Abu Sufyan telling Abu Lahab what happened. And as they were talking about it, Abu Rafi raised the curtain and said, those men dressed in white, those men riding on white horses, they were angels. And when Abu Lahab heard this, he stood up and punched him. He punched Abu Rafi in his face. And they began to fight each other until Abu Lahab had him on, on the ground. Um El Fado, when she saw what happened, she stood up and picked up a wooden pole and she hit Abu Lahab on his head. She said, he, said to him, you wanna beat him because you consider him weak in the absence of his master. Her husband, Abbas was his owner. She said, pick on somebody your own size. And she smashed him in the head with her pole. After that, Abu Lahab was taken away in humiliation. Seven, day later, seven days later, that's when he developed the measles and died. So everybody referred to uh, um, um, Um El Fado as being the one that killed Abu Lahab. Remember, nobody bothered her and her two sisters, they were warriors skilled with the, the, the spear and the bows and arrows and, and poles. The Arab women, they were women of the tents. They could take a pole and work it. And that's probably how she looked when she took him out, okay? After Abu Lahab died, a famous Jewish poet, who hated 
the Muslims made a poem about her. And the poem doesn't make sense to us, but this is considered a sarcastic song about her. Um, this Jewish tribe were enemies to her tribe. And this Jewish tribe also hated the Muslims. And I'm, this is the poem that's written in history that he made of her. And this poem is important because it shows that the Arab women wore makeup. I put this in here because this is from an authentic hadith and it shows that this they wore makeup and this is how she probably looked. Listen to the poem. It says, are you off without stopping in the valley and leaving Um Fadl in Mecca? Out would come what she brought bought from the peddler, her bottles, her henna, and her hair dye. What lies between the elbow and ankle is in motion when she tries to stand up and can't. Remember, guys, we talked about how there was a Jewish poet that used to write bad poems about the Muslim women. He ended up being killed. This is him. And she's one of the women he wrote about. Listen to this poem. What lies between the elbow and ankle when it's in motion, when she tries to stand up and can't stand up. Just like Um Hakam, I'm gonna do her story too. Just like Um Hakam when she's with us, the bond between us is strong and unbreakable. She is the one emirate who bewitches my heart. And if she wished, she could cure my sickness. The glory of women and of a people is their father. A people held an honor true to their oath. Never did I see the sun rise at night till I saw her show herself to us in the darkness of the night. Now, this is a sarcastic poem, and it turned into a song. After Abu Lahab died, the people were so upset, the Quraysh. And of course, they were cowards. Nobody would get in her face and challenge her. So they would sing this song to try to humiliate her. And when they speak in this song about the peddler's products and the wobbling flesh, this indicates to us that Um El Fado was kind of plump. She was plump in stature and she used to wear makeup. She used to make up her eyes and make up her face with tribal marks. Back in those days, guys, and they still do in some parts of Arabia, whatever tribe you came from, just like you Bantu, they have tribal marks. When I put in a generator tribal marks, early Medina, 7th century, this came up. So this probably was the tribal marks that the women wore on their cheeks in the 7th century Medina. They all wore kohol. They all, you know, darkened their eyebrows. They all made themselves look like that. Y'all see where they come from? Look at those Somali traits. Look at them cheekbones. Look at that mouth, nose. Yemen, Yemeni, that's where the Arabs originate from. All right, so, you know, this poem he made, you know, and uh, he called her middle age, when the reality is Um Fadl was under the age of 30. Remember, we talked about in another class here, back in those days, the early scholars considered anyone over the age of 30 as being middle age. The reason being because the lifespan for the Muslim is just 60 years. But in reality, guys, she was probably 27, 28, or 29. But they called her old, you know, middle age, making fun of her because she was plump. And because she used to wear henna on her face and her hands and her hair and, and her, eye, her eyes and stuff. Okay. Not only was Um El Fado a brave woman, but she was also extremely wise. Her understanding of the religion was profound. 
She was one of the women who witnessed the final pilgrimage of the prophet. Like I said, the Muslim female companions were never invisible. They were with the man, with the prophet, even on his pilgrimage. On the day of Arafat, many Muslims were confused as to whether the prophet was fasting or not. Y'all remember that hadith? Well, she was the one who offered the prophet a glass of milk. And the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, drank the milk. And that showed the rest of the people that he was not fasting. That was her own father. Okay. So you see, she's in all the history, all the hadith. She's, she's, her name comes up. Now, it wasn't until before, right before the conquest of Mecca, that her husband, Abbas, finally accepted Islam. He converted to Islam 20 years after her. She had been Muslim for 20 years, was living amongst the Muslims in Medina, okay? Left her husband, took her son Abbas with her and her other sons that converted. And when he became Muslim, that's when she finally went back to him. She finally went back to him as a wife after he converted to Islam. Um El Faro, she reported over 30, you know, I'm gonna put that in there because that's my thing, hadith. She's reported over 30 hadiths. She lived until the era of Uthman, ready Allahu anha. And I talked about her too. Remember, uh, she was with Sophia, the wife of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was with Sophia sneaking food, uh, trying to sneak food to Uthman before they murdered him. That's when I spoke about her before too. So basically that's the story of Um El Fadl.